Well, greetings and welcome to Let's Talk. My name is Jay O'Brien and I serve as a pastor at Scarlet City Church. And I'm joined by Pastor Court Marley from Providence Church in, it's spelled humble, Texas, but because Texans are so humble, they call it humble. I knew you were going to say something about Texas. I just didn't know it was going to come this quickly. Well, <laughs> you just had uh, to sass me this early in the conversation. <laughs> I mean, so, uh, so humble, <laughs> humble, Texas. And uh, is that where they make, is gumbo from there? Is it called, <laughs> is it pronounced umbo? It's but umbo. I just, all right. Yeah. That's where it came from. Nice. <laughs> Uh, Court isn't just a pastor. That's he doesn't sleep at the church. He also is married and has yep. two kids, uh, Jonas and uh, Jan. Right? Did I say it right? Jane. Jonas and Jane. Jane. That's right. Jan and, is a character from The Office. Oh that, yes, yeah. I, it's always on my mind. <laughs> I, that's what I was thinking. You're in quarantine, so you're just binge watching. <laughs> and Jane, they're adopting. They're in the process of adoption, and so. Um, been praying for them and it's been a long journey but really excited for for that to come to fruition and court and i we met each other through a cohort we're a part of which is uh, just a fancy way of saying a friend group um that we had to buy into kind of like a fraternity it's really and, shameful uh, actually <laughs> <laughs> so much money just to have friends i know <laughs> we, we, and we got to throw big uh mixers yep not big but just with us yeah. So I remember when I met Court, most of the times when you, you meet pastors, just, I just instinctively think, oh, they're probably boring and lame. <laughs> and then Court was sharing his story. And uh, part of that was you, you stole your teacher's car. You're in high school and you stole their car and you drove it around and then you got expelled. Was that what happened? Did you get expelled? Yeah. Well, there's part it's partially true it's actually worse though because i was in middle school so that makes it a little oh, worse that makes i uh <laughs> my uh i was a my mom enrolled me in a christian school i wasn't a christian yet but uh my mom enrolled me in a christian school i think that that was um mostly because she was concerned that i would be have some behavioral issues uh after my dad passed away so she enrolled me in a christian school and i was there for two years and just typical you know, junior high boy joking with a friend of mine. And we were just having, you know, the conversation of about who, who is more bold or crazy or something of that nature. Anyway, long story short, I stole her <laughs> minivan to prove that I was, you know, more legit than him. And uh, as I was reparking the minivan, the principal of the school was standing like just right at the spot of the minivan, letting me know that I needed to come in. And that was my last day. So and you tarnish the name of Christ already. So <laughs> you wore it with a badge of honor, probably. <laughs> at that time, yeah, it's a little it's a little worse now, but at least it, it made our friendship closer. So that's a good thing. I mean, that's like the ultimate middle school moment of you're getting in trouble and they're walking you away. Were police involved? <laughs> they didn't get any cops involved. Although I, you know, I was only in eighth grade, so I, I had never driven before. You know, I just jumped <laughs> in and tried to figure it out. So I'm like. I'm like jerking the brakes, you know, the, the tires are squealing around corners. Yeah. It was sketchy. Minivan was my first drive, my first car. So that's awesome. <laughs> hey, so when you shared that story, I was like, oh, yes. All right. A friend. Um, A kindred and, soul. <laughs> I, I, if we knew each other back then, there probably would have been a lot of trouble. So, how did, so how did you go from that? You're right. You're in eighth grade, stealing teachers minivans <laughs> yeah. um, and now you're a pastor what what led you to want to get into ministry so um that's that's a great question i i think that those were the, the seeds of the gospel were planted at that time I, I always loved bible class even though i i hadn't you know professed faith in christ or just loved loved bible class enjoyed the stories and went from there to uh so in high school, um, I just had a really unique moment with the Lord kind of reaping the harvest on the gospel being planted in my heart. I was in my truck um, on my way to like a Chick-fil-A, I think, and a, a actual just an acquaintance. He wasn't a friend at the time, but an acquaintance of mine asked me for a ride home. He ended up saying one line about 
his mother had cancer and he said he was just going to trust God through it. Just like it was, there was nothing, uh, you know, uh, enlightening about the conversation that we had, but when he got out of the car and, you know, went in to see his mom, uh, the Lord just broke me. And, um, that's when I came to know Christ. And from there, I would say the calling into ministry was not, um, drastically miraculous. It's just like gradual Mm. servant oriented obedience to the next thing. I never thought I would be a, a pastor. I remember my wife, my wife and I are high school sweethearts. And she, so she was, we dated before I came to know Jesus. And then after I came to know Christ and started serving in a youth ministry, I joined an internship my freshman year of college and then asked her what she thought about me being a youth pastor. And she laughed at me. <laughs> so clearly she didn't think so either, but yeah, I, I, my answer to the question is uh, the calling into ministry was very gradual. It wasn't like a moment where I really felt like, Hey, I'm going to pastor for the rest of my life. God said so. Um, I just, they, you know, it was really starting from, Hey, do you want to be a front door greeter? And I said, sure, because I, you know, wouldn't mind serving people. And then it was like, Hey, do you want to be a, a member of the worship band? Cause I could play an instrument. Sure. Do you want to, you know, be a small group leader? Sure. And that just kind of progressed into before I knew it, I was, I was a youth pastor. Mm, that's awesome. That's how it worked. What, what if, you know, I think on some level people get into ministry and everyone's a little naive. You know, you, you, you think a little bit like parenting, you know, you have it all yeah. figured out and then you're fine. What are some things that surprised you about getting into ministry? What are some things that are challenging that were some challenges that maybe you didn't foresee? Man, there's so many to pick from. Um, I, I think, you know, every year, every month, every week's a new, a new learning process of how much you really know and how much you really can control, um, mm. how much you really can, um, I guess, contribute to the advancing of the kingdom. I think the naivety is, is that there's so, there's so much I'm going to do for Jesus. Mm. And then over time, uh, that begins to, the layers get pulled back. You start realizing that Jesus is doing the work and mm. you're long for the ride. So mm. I have a, a problem, a million answers to that, but, I think at different stages of ministry, there were different like light bulb moments in student ministry. Um, the difficulties were, well, I, I was a student pastor at like 19. Mm. And so I think I thought, uh, you know, people, I was, I was liked, well liked. And um, that's a, that's a good place to be in a church. You kind of feel like a golden boy. You know, this is, you came to know Christ, people saw you mature, people see, they like that. It's almost like they, they take you on as a child of theirs. Mm. So they're like, look at what this child in the faith is doing. And then the light bulb moment was recognizing that like leadership is different than being like the child of the church, mm. and the expectations that come along with that. And like, you know, you're leading a summer camp and there's a dad talking to you about why am I going to let my 17 year old daughter go with this 19 year old kid to summer mm. camp? And you have to explain that. And I think in church planting, um, the naivety was the, the la- me not recognizing the spiritual warfare that would, hmm. that would come with that. I think I just assumed that there were, it would all be, you know, like you, you get at your X 29 boot camps, you know, be, be like that. Mm-hmm. Oh, I totally can feel that. I, I remember cause it was kind of similar, you know, go entering into ministry and I was like the, the leader guy, the young guy. And, um, and then when you plan a church <laughs> and all of a sudden you feel this whole new weight. Yeah. And I remember thinking any pastor that I ever criticized, I was such a fool. Yes. <laughs> like any, any time I thought I knew better or like that you just didn't know there's like a certain uh, place of luxury uh, to be involved in leadership and you're not in that role. It's a very heavy, heavy thing. Absolutely. And it's lonely or right. Like you kind of take for granted that at some level, when you come to know Christ, if you become a part of a, a local body that in some ways, any leadership role you take is, was sacrificed for by this pastor who, mm. you know, laid down their life, did, did so many things behind the scenes and before you ever even were there mm. to make this possible. Um, and you just take those for granted. And th- in that way, I agree. It's kind of like the naivety of children with their parents, right? It's like, mm-hmm. until you live out on your own, you don't really know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and church planting is that like ruthless reality of, you know, the first time your light bill comes and you don't pay it and then the lights are out. You're like, oh man, 
<laughs> I just always thought the lights were on, you know? And, yeah. and so like, I remember like the first time in the living room with having been a, a very, you know, a uh, golden child of ministry. And then the first time in your living room as a church planter where you have almost no one. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, you're not as celebrated as you were, mm. or at least as, as he felt. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a good experience, even though it was a really hard one. Mm -hmm. It's a good experience because it's very, it's very humbling or humbling. If you want to use that <laughs> term. <laughs> you know, Court, one of the things I, I really value about you and in our friendship, I feel like you're a really good pastor in the full sense of the term. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you about leading in difficult situations. Uh, we are, I mean, obviously the world is experiencing a whole degree of disruption and adjustment and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, a crisis and it affects and it has numerous ways that it plays out in different places. Um, and so I, I want to talk to you about how do we lead in that, in those spaces and even thinking through people, whether not just for pastors, but um, people in their homes, moms and dads, people with their uh, roommates, people in the workplace, just thinking broadly about leadership in hard situations. And as I think about what that looks like, you know, one of the things and why I feel like you, I'm really excited to talk to you is there both, there's both a personal part of that, of leading people, not just the collective people, but, individuals, um, shepherding, caring, and then also leading a group, navigating yeah. the complexities of a difficult situation. So I'd love to start with that personal angle. What are some things you've learned or experienced in life about what it looks like to lead people in just a hard place, someone who's suffering, grieving, navigating a, a part of a thing they didn't anticipate? What have you learned? Yeah, so uh, obviously it's timely, right? And like you said, this is a we're all of us are in a difficult situation, which then then be to varying degrees. So, mm -hmm. like I'm sure you've experienced this even pastoring your people. So the pandemic itself is stressful. It's scary. It's difficult, and everyone's trying to navigate their way through it. And leaders have a unique responsibility to try to have some semblance of a voice, even though we don't. There's so much limited information, and then we struggle with what's verifiable information, and it's just difficult. Mm -hmm. But then I think as a pastor, you probably experienced that. And then there are varying degrees of suffering. So some people might be able to be uh, at home working right now. And that's mm -hmm. tough for them, but it's not maybe the same level of tough that someone who was furloughed or lost their job or is losing their business or is maybe even sick or lost a loved one or is immunocompromised. You see, there's all these layers. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where it comes down to you mentioned personal versus organizational and pastors do both. And yet I think that if it's easy to lose sight of one or the other. Mm. So on one level as a pastor, you're thinking, okay, when are we going to reopen? And you're making big decisions like that. And you're making big organizational decisions for finances and, you know, you continue on and on and all these directional decisions affect the individual. But mm. then you know that, well, to use my daughter's name, let's say Jane over here, she, she genuinely uh, is terrified because she's, she's got an immunocompromised issue. And, mm. and so one decision that you could make to open could really affect her because mm. that's going to, now what does that mean? She can't come to church. Does that mean she's not being faithful? You know, there's all these questions. And I always ask the, the question, okay, what is leadership? What am I really required to do? And what am I not required to do? And that's one thing I've learned or tried to continue learning is I don't want to overstep Hmm. and pretend to know or to be some someone or something that God has not called me to be. Hmm. So that would mean, you know, trying to take away uh, others responsibility on one hand, but also right to make decisions in their lives. And that that's part of what is God given for families to make certain decisions. So I want to, I want to be able to empower and do everything I can to guide and to pastor them to make decisions that they're supposed to make and that I'm not called to make for them. Hmm. And on the flip side, I also don't want to shy away and abdicate um, where I am called to lead, decisions that I am called to make. So, so defining leadership in those terms, like what's the field that God's called you to, to actually plow in, where don't overstep, don't, don't shy away. And then the question's like, wh where are you leading people? Mm. So I think that gets lost. Like I, I struggle with at times getting lost with that and 
there's a lot of uh, voices that try to tell us as pastors where we ought to be leading people. But I think the scriptures are pretty clear. We're leading people uh, to Christ likeness. So to Jesus, to become more like Jesus, spiritual formation is a, is a primary call for us to lead people to there. Mm. And so that does two things. It puts a real seriousness on, okay, how we should make decisions, but then also it takes some weight off because we're reminded we know spiritual formation isn't going to happen in a three month quarantine all at once, you know? And, and, and I would say that for any difficult situation, it's like, I, I don't need to think that I'm going to be able to, that's one of the benefits of pastoring. I would think rather than an evangelist is I'm hopefully I have this person for more than 30 minutes. Hmm. So I don't need to feel as though I'm supposed to be leading them into their full spiritual formation in the next 30 minutes in this hospital room in this very difficult situation, which in some ways has, uh, has helped me uh, to, to learn the ministry of presence and mm. trying to uh, be okay with not being everything and in that moment to them uh, to lead. So I, I would say perspective's big. Having perspective on who you are who, what, as a leader, what's God called you to do, what has he called you not to do? And then where are you leading people? You know, as a, as a family, as a father, you know, mm. you got a responsibility. And I think that's maybe like the most easy uh, drawn lines, right? As a, a leader of your home, maybe fathers and mothers, but I'm, I'm a man. So obviously I think through the father lens, like what am I supposed to do here as a father? And I, and I don't want to go over to your house and start, you know, telling your kids what to do, or <laughs> I don't want to overstep, but then I don't want to also allow my children to be on your lawn, you know, and, and then say, well, you know, I don't know what they, I don't know what they're doing, but it's not really my role, you know? So that's, that's what I would say is getting perspective, leading people where, and what am I called to do? One of the things I like in, in what you shared, um, it really honors people. I think sometimes as past pastors can come across in a very, uh, dishonoring way. And I get the, uh, you know, concept of spiritual fathers and we're almost like, you know, we're just friends to people and we support and there's a leadership component, but I don't know. I, I, I think not everyone's like you and me and they're them and I'm me and you're you yeah. <laughs> and God created us all different. And I always, it's a tension because, you know, there's like a, on what level are decisions and things foolish and on what level are they just different? <laughs> yeah. And being okay with that. Yeah. Some people are more comfortable going out and about during the quarantine. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to be wise, like, you know, not running around hugging everyone and coughing in them like that would not be good, but there are degrees, you know, um, yeah. and respecting people. I think that's yeah. so lost in our polarized, in our polarized world. Yeah, I don't know about you, but you tell me what you think about this. But I, you know, we have differing opinions too all around, not, not just in the church congregation, but also just in our city. But I, I, by and large, think that most people have, uh, don't want to harm people. They don't want to get other people sick. They don't want to get their family members sick. They don't want to be irresponsible. Um, and they also don't want everybody to be in such a, economic crisis or whatever, you know, all the other sides of this. I, I'm most people that I talk to, I haven't found someone that's just like, I don't care about people getting sick. They deserve mm -hmm. it. Or, you know, but I think that that, that narrative is mostly what I see is that you, you only hate to be on one side, mm -hmm. either. You just don't care about people at all. And you're just like, you know, the, the, the elderly and the, and those who are, you know, maybe most at risk, uh, who cares? Or on the flip side, uh, you're just, you're just a snowflake. You know, you're just, you're just way too, you know, risk averse. It's no big deal at all. What are you doing? You know, this is all a consp whatever it is, all a conspiracy people might think. Mm. I just think that when I talk with most people, I haven't found a ton of people that are that, that are on that far of the spectrum. And yet mm. I guess like, uh, whether it be social media or just media in general, I, I feel as though that's the only narrative that is, that is talked about. It's only people that are on extremes. And I think, so to, an, to answer your question on why honoring people is important is honoring that, especially Christians, we're believing that the spirit is going to lead Christians to be wise and mm. that in community, we can, we can learn wisdom too. And so if we listen to one another, that's why I really appreciate what you're doing with, uh, with let's talk, you know, just, just opening up conversation is a great way to, uh, 
find common ground. It's a great way for people to, to grow and to learn as we listen to one another and share opinions that might be differing. I think that that's part of what honoring looks like is mm. I, want, I want to trust that, yes, I have a role and I don't want to abdicate that, but I want to also trust that part of my role is to remind Christians that the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives in them, that the spirit is faithful to bring us to truth. The spirit is faithful to lead us in wisdom. Hmm. Um, and that, and that, yeah, maybe we might fall on different ends, but those different ends probably are not going to look like that far away. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. What do you think about that? Do you feel that same way in your, in your town that people aren't as like this as it maybe it's painted or that they're maybe closer to here, but it feels like this. Um, yeah, I think you're right. I think, Unfortunately, a lot of times people buy into what they see on Twitter or what's <laughs> happening online. And so they feel a polarization more than what's there. And I think part of leadership uh, in these challenging times, like you've said, is, is teach, modeling for people how to respect one another. And that, yeah, we're not all so different. If we all right. focus on all of our differences, then... You know, we'll only see life through that lens. There is a difference sometimes, but there's also so much in common. Yeah. And I I think that's one of the things I've learned in pastoring. I remember when um, I first planted and, you know, came, it was like, oh, vision and city and we're going to do this stuff. And really what was happening was I was communicating things I was excited about, but most people that they, that's not where they were. They were wondering, Hey, will you be my friend? Yeah. Can we play video games together? Can we pray together? Will you be there for me when life sucks? Right. What do you care about my kids? <laughs> you know, like normal yes. human questions. And, um, yeah, I don't know. It's like, do, do, am I, do I have a posture of like, I like presence, like you mentioned before, being, being with people, honoring mm-hmm. them, listening, it's just so, so important. I mean, it is the vision in a way. So what have you learned yeah. then in like, yeah, go ahead. Are you saying something? I was going to say you, you like something, you mentioned something that, you know, saying that I, uh, you know, a pastor, which is really encouraging. Thank you for saying that. I, something I feel like I learned from you and a, really a couple of other guys in our cohort, maybe like one of the first times we got together. Um, I feel like you guys are great listeners. You in particular, your ability to listen intently uh, and and to withhold interjection Uh, and not just to withhold interjection, but to listen and let someone share their heart. And um, I think I learned that from our group and, and particularly from you as such a gift in pastoral care and leadership. It is such a gift to be a listener. I just, I struggled with that. I will say, I still struggle with it to this day because I, I think I was trained in ministry that you show up to situations to lead, which means you, you are expected to speak in and bring direction, clarity, truth, vision, all the things that you just mentioned, which that's a half truth, right? I do think that's a part, but I think if you don't first listen, then you could be shooting from the hip and maybe totally missing the target. What you thought this people, these people needed from you is not what they needed from you. Mm. Uh, whether that's the church or whether that's even your own home. I, I, I realized that, you know, from, from my marriage and fatherhood all the way up into, you know, any leadership role that I took that oftentimes I wasn't first listening well. And I just think that you do a great job of, of listening to people and then hearing the things that maybe they don't even hear themselves saying, which I think is a real gift. Mm. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. So, and as we're kind of think through applying that organizationally, um, you've navigated Providence through some, some hard situations, a number of things. Um, one of which was the flood a few years ago in Houston. Um, and then now certainly we're all leading an organization in, in this situation what are some things you've learned that make for wise, healthy leading organizational leadership and hard things? Yeah, we had a, we had a number of things happen in Providence that were pretty, pretty drastic. There was a, there was a season in our church uh, 
well, really from, from the very jumps, our first prayer meeting that we had, uh, we had a, a, a gal that was at our prayer meeting whose father was, was killed and mm. that night. And so that was just tragic right off the bat, you know, trying to learn pastoral care on the fly in some ways. Uh, we had a, a, a season where we, we lost some, in the early days, we lost some, uh, some children um, early in their, in their lives. And it was just heartbreaking, just gut wrenching mm. stuff. I, I was very averse to it, struggled to, to try to figure out how to lead through that. Uh, honestly, even just to live through that, like in my own spirituality, much less try to lead through it. Mm. Um, but one thing that I feel like I've learned through all of that, the flood you mentioned with Harvey, is that uh, when crisis hits, panic sets in pretty quick. Mm. Uh, part of that's biological. So, you know, part of that's adrenaline sets in. So like the fight or flight happens. It doesn't, it doesn't, that doesn't have to happen when you get a gun pulled on you. It can happen anytime when your body feels threatened and in crisis, you're, you feel physically threatened. This happens. Now that's a gift from, from your body that God created us this way, but it also can really lead to some bad leadership decisions hmm. because part of leadership is being able to be level headed in those moments. Um, and, and make very quick and important and steady decisions. Um, but I also think the gift of it is that it can, um, it can give you the energy that you need in order to, to really confront things that if it were just to come like at the end of a day, you know, end of a, what we're at Tuesday today, you know, if it comes at four 30 at the office and something like that were to happen and you didn't have that visceral reaction, you'd be like, man, I just don't even care. Mm-hmm. So one thing that I've learned is, how to submit to I've tried to learn to submit to the spirit Mm. and, and to be steady and uh, not, not react or overreact to uh, crisis situations, but to basically to half of the battle is showing up for, for those situations and just whether it's showing up for people who are hurting or in need, or if it's just showing up to the body as they're, not knowing what direction to take um, and then being faithful. I think of in the scriptures, just the Jesus Christ being the same yesterday, today, and forever. I think about the steadiness of God's hand through crisis that like the prophets tone, even though in the old Testament, the prophets have a, a pretty sharp tone at times and it can be urgent. The, the consistency of God's faithful covenantal love, is always something that sticks in my mind as a pastor's responsibility, a shepherd of the sheep, you know, Mm. Uh, John 10 talks about when the, when the robber comes or when the wolf comes that the hired hand will flee. I think that's the panic reaction. Mm. There's a, there's an adverse reaction to that, which is sometimes um, an over aggressive shepherd will shoot too Mm. quickly. And I think that this, you think about Jesus and Jesus interactions in some pretty intense moments in ministry just very steady, honest, truthful, um, and, and, and doesn't seem to be overreacting, but, but appropriately and, and honestly re- reacts to what's happening. So that's the way I've tried to approach it. Harvey was just a really, man, what a crazy time. It was, we drive, I remember we're driving, I was driving to check on a friend of mine's, uh, friend of mine's parents' house. And one, one day it was, everything was fine. There was no water on the streets. And this was a storm that kind of, I don't know how, how familiar some of your listeners are to it, but it was a storm, a hurricane that came onto the coast and basically just hovered over us for about seven to 10 days mm. and just dropped, you know, feet of rain and water. And so one day I'm driving and everything's fine. The house is good. The next day I drove into the church because uh, a fellow church planner, uh, Pastor Bryant Lee, he's, he's a fellow actually nine guy down the road from us. He, he was going to check on some of his members and we got stuck on uh, the beltway water everywhere. And then I went to go check on my friend's house and got stopped in the middle of the road. Boats were going. Hmm. And so I jumped on a boat that morning and I didn't get home till that night, but we were rescuing people out of houses because the floodgates had opened. Hmm. So it was just a crazy time, but there were some also really special moments. Uh, I remember getting to pray with some of the people we were pulling out as they were on their boats, watching all their belongings hmm. go away. We prayed and I got to pray with them. And months later, contacting me and just saying that the Lord had met them and that that was, uh, even though it was one of the worst moments of their life, that it was one of the best moments because the mm. Lord met them. So that was just very sweet. Um, because I mean, I know, you know, this Jay, there's sometimes where people think that pastors like in those moments that it was just this 
overt wisdom that they had versus mm. really we're just fumbling through and trying to be faithful. Mm. I don't know what I prayed. It probably wasn't articulate. It probably wasn't, you know, anything special, but, but for that woman, it, the Lord met her there. So crisis provides opportunity uh, for the Lord to, to meet us. And even though I don't think any of us should or desire to, to seek out crisis, I think that we should look for the Lord's hand in it. Mm. And that was, that's been my experience. I mean, you, you navigate some stuff at Scarlet City, I know, <laughs> some hard times. Yeah. I, I love that picture of being in the boat. I think that's a, I mean, that's leadership, good leadership, showing up uh, and even not running in fear. <laughs> um, yeah. There's that temptation. Um, or, yeah, just, uh, getting in the boat and getting out a megaphone and start barking out orders or thinking we got to like navigate new things at the city, but what's the need right now? Yeah. What do people, people, their homes are flooding. We're going to help them. (laughs) Yes. Uh, So it's so hard. It's like that presence. Uh, It can be tempting to try to figure, come up with a game plan and have it all figured out. Um, five or 10 or 20 years down the road. And it's just like, right now I'm going to show up. I'm going to fumble through and pray with someone and let them know that I love them. Um, I think that's a really good picture of, of leadership. Yeah. yeah I actually, my, my brother is a firefighter. And so he, and I think he's uniquely gifted and called to do what he does because he, since we were, he's my older brother. So since I've been young, he's been jumping into action to, you know, rescue me from bad situations where I was, you know, getting myself into. And, uh, but he has that, that innate ability to when things are in crisis kind of jump to. Um, and one, one moment in particular for my brother, and I'm sure he won't mind me sharing it. Um, but my, my brother lost his, uh, during that time, I said that we lost some, some children. My brother lost his his youngest child to um, uh, just rest almost like SIDS like uh, accident in the middle of the night. And, um, and I remember standing in the hospital with him and just on the other side of the sheet was my, my nephew. And in that moment I was his pastor, but I didn't know what to do. I mean, I'm just devastated Mm. families out. And one of our other elders was staying there with me and I didn't know what to offer. I just, I felt completely out of my depth and my brother, um, just grabbed my hand and grabbed the other elder's hand and said, let's, let's pray. Mm-hmm. And then just basically in the most simple and one of the most profound prayers I've ever been a part of, just began to tell God that he trusted him. And it was, it was powerful. And so I, I think there's a, like, there's something about men and, and, and women who, who are willing to, to stand faithful in times of crisis that helps anchor other people. Mm. And, uh, and that faithfulness doesn't have to be, um, you know, a big platform. That's like you said, barking out orders from them, from the megaphone. It can be a very quiet, silent faithfulness. And that's what my brother was doing in a time where I feel like I should have been the one anchoring him. Mm. Uh, and, and it taught me a lot about like in times of crisis, what people are really looking for. Mm. And I, I, I find it sad a little bit that, you know, in this pandemic, there's a lot of voices that just, man, lots of voices creating more division, lots of voices creating more fear. And I think what the church should take note of is we need to have some people who are a safe place, a safe spot mm. that, that people, it's a beacon of hope. People look over there and say, Hey, everything's, you know, uncertain and everything's difficult, but that person you mentioned it as like a friend or playing video games with me. This person seems like they'll care. Mm. You know, this person seems like an anchor. Mm. Um, and so that, that was really, that was really meaningful and moving for me is, is just seeing my brother act as that in a moment when man, I thought, I thought I should have been that for him. Mm. I love that. I, it brings together those two parts of the personal and the organizational that both are about caring yeah, and just being present and bringing 
whatever word that we have. It doesn't need to be right. this uh, thing that's tweetable or something. It's just, I'm here. I'm with you. We have Jesus. <laughs> yeah. And um, man, that's, that's, what, that's what we all need. Yeah, I find it like, look at the ministry of Jesus and how often uh, it's as powerful as the word, red letters of Jesus are. Can you just imagine how much he leaves unsaid? Mm. I just, it baffles me at times. Like I think of myself and how, if I'm talking with a person who's doubting, for instance, their faith, I would say so much more than what Jesus said to Thomas. Mm. Mm. Jesus was just totally unassuming the only person that we desperately needed to hear every word from his mouth. And he was very regularly (laughs) short-winded, you know, but with such authority, with such, Mm. I mean, the power Jesus walked in without having to exert it is just Mm. so I, I, I can't, it's hard to articulate it because it's, it's what causes worship in your heart. That's what I think a pastor's aim. Jesus is humanizing people. Um, Jesus is asking questions of them when he has all the answers. Hmm. Uh, you think, I mean, think about the moments of crisis he steps into with Mary and Martha or um, the, the woman whose, whose son uh, is there at the funeral and he touches, he touches the casket and brings her back to life. Jairus's daughter. There's like seven words he speaks at all these situations. Hmm. And I find that I often feel compelled or maybe it's, uh, like your internal internal bully, you know, to try and like articulate it, whatever everyone needs as a pastor, rather than just trusting that the spirit's going to do a mighty work as you, you know, stand with this person. And maybe you're able to offer a few words, <laughs> but it's really not about that at mm. its heart. You know, I don't know. Mm. That's really good. Well, man, I, I really appreciate your time. And, uh, and thank you for being, for your work as a minister. I'm glad God, uh, you know, took a a young guy who got expelled from his Christian school, (laughs) um, to, uh, to be in a minister. And, um, and I'm grateful for our friendship and the ways you're an encouragement to me and, and, uh, yeah. So thank you so much for your time. Dude. Thanks for having me, Jay. I love you, man. All right. Love you too, bro. God bless.